like to, um, Angela and I would like to thank everyone for joining in as we uh, discuss astrophotography and Hoya filters with Rachel Jones Ross. Joining us, we have Angela Ledyard, which is our co-founder of Black Female Landscape and Nature Photographer. We have Beatrice Cox, which is new. She just joined our group. We have James Tweedy and we have Akira Rice. And of course, our speaker, Rachel Jones Ross. Thank you so much for having me. So you just got back from Hawaii, right? Yeah, I was on a red eye <laughs> flying home. I left Hawaii at 10.30 p.m., got into Vancouver this morning at something like 6.30 a.m. Some, And then time change in there. There's about three hours time difference between home and Hawaii. And then I got on another flight come, and then drove an hour. So yeah, it's been a big travel day, mm -hmm. but I'm wow. here and I'm really happy to be here. So, wow. <laughs> and I'm caffeinated. Well, I'm on um, my 14th cup little, of coffee today. We did a little um, research on you mm -hmm. and we understand that you are a coffee loving, <laughs> life chasing intellectual junkie. Yeah. <laughs> who, who's most inspired by a sky full of stars. Also, Rachel is a, which I'm proud to say, Sony Imaging Ambassador and Collective. Um, she has a passion for astrophotography, and that's what we're going to talk about today, astrophotography and um, Hoya filters. So go ahead, Rachel. Tell us a little awesome. bit. Thank you so much. Um, so if you enable me to share my screen, I have a little have a few images prepared for you there. Okay, let's see. Oh, yeah. And I can share the screen now. So that's great. Oh, um, and I will pull up this. So this can kind of give you guys a little idea about my work and what I do and how I do things. Um, I'm just going to um, make the images of you guys small here so that I can show you my screen. How's that? Can you see it? Yes. 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 Perfect. Okay. So, all right. So as Keisha was saying, I am an astro nerd. Um, I first, my, my journey into photography really started with astrophotography. I kind of learned everything backwards. Um, I had a camera in my hand my whole life, I think, <laughs> maybe not my whole life, but most of it. And it wasn't until I saw a, an acquaintance of mine, um, he was posting some images of the Milky Way on Facebook and I messaged him and I was like, you have to teach me how to do that. And this was, this was a lot of years ago now, dating myself but way back in my undergrad days. And, um, and anyway, so he said, I'm going out I'm going out tonight if you want to join me and and I did and I had a, I had a crop sensor camera with a kit lens it was mostly terrible but he let me borrow a lens and when I looked at the back of my camera and I saw that image it was p.s a very crappy image by today's standards an incredibly bad image with terrible processing but when I looked at it I was totally gobsmacked like the fact that I could see something with my camera that I couldn't see with my eye was magical to me like somebody pulling back a curtain and allowing me to to look into the universe and that's what inspired me to really love photography and really learn about the technical side of photography so even though I consider myself a very creative individual I I'm a, I have a very strong technical background and that's how I can pull images together with um, really with a really wide range of um, like dynamic range. I can I can shoot in all kinds of environments. I combine multiple images in a lot of my images, and sometimes I'm lucky enough to just get things in a single shot. So I'll walk you through kind of like what my process is and and where I started and, and why I go out in the middle of the night by myself a lot. Oh, and this image, this one, I don't know if you're curious about this, but this is my friend, Vanessa. 
who's on a plane to come and see me right now. I'm really excited that I get to see, see her and spend a week with her. Um, but we shot the foreground during blue hour, which is a time when the sun is just below the horizon and there's no directional light from the sun, but there's enough light that you can shoot everything at say F11 for 30 seconds. It was a lot colder than it looks in the photo. And the whole time she was like shivering and I was trying to do long exposures, like 30 seconds. <laughs> So the joke is, stop shivering, Vanessa, <laughs> because she couldn't hold still for the photo. And then, so then we waited for the stars to come out and I didn't move my camera, I didn't move my tripod. And then once the stars were in position, I, I got my star shots and blended them together. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. So that's what a lot of my work is. I do a lot of, uh, I call that, or we call that in the in uh, night photography, blue hour blending, because you get the shots during blue hour. And then, and then without moving the camera, I wait for the stars to come out. And then I take a lot of, sometimes multiple images of the sky and then I blend those together. And that's what you're seeing in these examples. Hmm. Okay. Um, I am kind of getting ahead of myself here a little bit, but um, one of the things that Keisha had asked me about was my 100 Nights Under the Stars project. So I'm so in love with night sky photography that a couple of years ago, I think this was 2018, everything's like pre-COVID or post-COVID. So it was pre-COVID. Um, but I decided that as a personal project, I really wanted to get out and spend 100 nights under the stars. And my goal was to do that all in a year. But I live in the Canadian Rockies and the weather here is challenging at best. Um, we get clouded out a lot and um, mountain weather is very unpredictable. So I can't tell you how many times I went out to shoot and just came home cold or <laughs> cold, hungry, tired. <laughs> but I did end up spending probably three, 300 nights outside. I don't know, I didn't really get stars the whole time. Um, got lots of clouds. But I learned how to shoot in many, many different environments. It was a really, really good learning experience for me. And, and not only did I shoot in lots of different kinds of environments, but I really got to learn about the light at night and how it changes and, and how I can work with it. So, you know, there's, there's all different kinds of ways that we can shoot the night sky. Um, I just described one, which is blue hour blending, but sometimes we can get it in a single shot. And sometimes um, maybe we want to try some new toys. I'm trying out uh, a tracker right now and having a lot of fun with that. Um, but yeah, uh, there, was, there was a lot I learned. Um, I learned about planning and I have a little section today that I can talk to you guys about planning and um, just shooting in, in different types of light. This one's another blue hour blend. This one I went out um, to a local spot that's pretty famous. It's called Moraine Lake. And I think there's probably no less than a trillion pictures of it on the internet, uh, <laughs> but it's famous for a reason. It's pretty beautiful there. It's called the Valley of the 10 peaks. And so you drive into this beautiful mountain scene and there's a lake there that is usually like a turquoise green, but obviously at night we don't necessarily see those brilliant colors. Um, and in this shot, I happen to be there right as the road to the lake had been closed, but we had an aurora forecast that night. And it was a rather big aurora forecast, which made this particular shot special because from where I live in the Rockies, you have to be looking northwards to be able to see the aurora. And this view that you're seeing here, it faces south. Mm -hmm. So to get aurora over Moraine Lake is a rare event that only happens when we get really, really big auroras. So that night I hiked 25 kilometers in freezing temperatures, very cold temperatures. Um, I think it was probably only minus 15 or so that night. Um, oh so it wasn't too bad. But I started, I started when I got there, the lake was not frozen. There was waves lapping up onto the shore. And I spent the whole night and I stayed and waited for the Aurora. And that's as strong as it really got in that direction facing south, facing north. I was like 
it was absolutely dancing and it was crazy to watch and experience. But by the next morning, the lake had frozen over and so did my toes. <laughs> they were very painful when they, when I started to move around again and they started to thaw out. But um, this is, you know, I can spend a whole night shooting and walk away with one image. And this night I actually walked away with two, but uh, it's not uncommon for me to spend a whole night to invest in, in a single shot. And the, sh the foreground, because it didn't freeze until morning, I actually, this is more of a composite because I was shooting the sky from about 100 feet down the lake to the left. And then as I was leaving in the morning, I, I saw this little patch had frozen overnight and got these methane bubbles in it. So I shot the foreground during blue hour and then I combined the sky that I was shooting from 100 feet to the left and uh, combined it with that blue hour shot. This is pretty, it was really so pretty. Thank you. So that's actually what the foreground looked like. Wow, okay. <laughs> so you can see mm -hmm. uh, the sun was just starting to come up there and I barely got the shots where the light was touching the peaks. Oops, going the wrong way. Wow. Up here and oh, I have a little video of the famous Moraine Lake all frozen. So this, this lake, it's very uncommon to get a shot of it frozen without snow on it because it typically snows right away and then the lake gets covered up and you don't see it. Um, and here's another sort of blue hour blend. Uh, this one's a local spot. Um, it's only actually 20 minutes from me. Mm. But the cool thing about shooting a blue hour blend here is there's a lot of light pollution. And so I can get a cleaner shot of the landscape if I do it when there's not a lot of light pollution from the night sky or from the, sorry, the town of Banff there. So this one's a little bit of a different look just because um, I was able to mute the natural, well, not really natural, the man-made light that's there at night. And then if I'm feeling super creative, I right. <laughs> blue hour blue hour shooting. I can actually overlay a single blue hour image. As long as I'm not moving my tripod, um, this works really well. But this is actually Vanessa and her husband, Neil, and they were celebrating their 25th wedding anniversary. So I got some shots of them up on the arch dancing and that was during blue hour. And then without moving the camera, I waited for the Milky Way to come up and I photographed the whole time-lapse sequence. And then I overlaid the blue hour image of them dancing on top of the time lapse. That's amazing. Thank you. It was pretty fun to do. So the kind of shooting I do, there's a lot of planning that goes into it. And I know this is one of the things that Keisha was asking about. Um, this little example here is uh, just, a, just a touch, just a small example of how nerdy I get about, about planning. This is the notes in my phone for a trip that I was planning um, earlier this summer. Actually, it was for October, November. But I write down, you know, what time of what time of the night I might expect certain light conditions. Um, I include photos for reference. I will look at the weather and include, you know, snapshots of the weather, how uh, what I might be expecting for weather at that time temperature and clouds, mostly clouds, temperature, I just deal with most of the time. But I always start my planning kind of, you know, before I'm ever on a location. And, um, and I, I keep a lot of notes if you have ever, <laughs> this, this is just one note out of like a thousand notes on my phone. Um, and this is how I keep track of things. I was going to ask you about photo pills. <laughs> photo pills is my favorite tool. So a lot of people ask me like, what is the one thing you couldn't live with without if you were going out for a night shoot? I could live without my headlamp because I'm pretty good at stumbling around in the dark and I can find all the buttons on my camera and all the rest of it. So I could live without a headlamp and um, I couldn't live without a tripod obviously, but the one thing I feel like I couldn't live without that's not obvious is photo pills. Um, I use this for everything. So it's involved in my pre-trip planning, but it's also when I get out there 
and I'm on location, I can use it for planning. So I have a few examples here that I can show you that I've screen grabbed. Um, but so you can kind of look at, you know, photo pills, the there's a, um, in the one, one of the main pills here, they're called pills, each one of them. Um, it just says sun on it. And this will give you and um, a breakdown of the of the different light hours, I'll call them. But when it's daylight, um, when your moon's going to come up, golden hour, sunset, blue hour, nautical twilight, and astro twilight. And these are these are conditions that I look for because there's different kinds of shooting that can happen in these different types of of light. Um, and I'll. I have some examples I can show you, but so far I've been talking about blue hour blends and that's just me shooting the foreground during blue hour, which is usually this that time period before nautical twilight, um, but after the sun goes down and then I'll wait for true nighttime to photograph the sky. But there are situations when I really like to be out during astronomical twilight and I'll show you what can be done with astro twilight here in a couple of slides. Um, but photopills is also awesome for sort of, you know, looking at the moon. This is the moon cat. This is a, I plan my workshops around this. I plan my shoots around this. I, I plan my life around the moon calendar. Even the holidays, like I, if I was going to plan a holiday, I would probably plan a holiday. I'm more likely to plan a holiday over uh, a full moon than I am over new moon because then I'm less likely to feel like I should be out shooting instead of actually on a holiday. Um, and then if you were to click on any one of these days, you can pull up the moon calendar and that would give you um, what time the moon is gonna rise and set. You can figure out what direction it's gonna rise and set, um, how much moon there is. And um, so it's just tons of really useful sort of at a glance information that I would use before I even set out to shoot on a particular night. And these, um, you can actually set these as widgets on your phone. And I find that really helpful to just go to the widgets page and there it is. Mm -hmm. Although I have a new phone, so I don't have them set up currently, but I miss them. So I mentioned that there's um, really special conditions that you can get if you're out shooting during twilight. And this is one of my favorites. So. Um, a few years ago when I was in Patagonia, I got light that's very similar to this um, during a full moon and the moon was really low on the horizon and the, and it was during um, astronomical twilight. And what happens when you get all those conditions at the same time is the light from the moon will underlight the clouds like you see here. But because it's astronomical twilight, there's still some pinks and some color, maybe peachy tones, pinky tones, um, residual from the sun. So the sun is below the horizon enough at that time that you start to get the, the just these sort of pink, pink and peachy tones. And if you can get sort of a 50% cloud, I know I'm being really particular here right now, um, but if you can get some gaps in the clouds, then you can also see the stars through it. And I, and I think that's a pretty magical combination. So using photo pills, I can actually show you guys how to, um, to plan to find this kind of light. So what I do is I go into the moon pill, like I showed you on the previous page and um, if you scroll down to the bottom, you can see this like slider bar here. Mm -hmm. And if I slide that slider bar along to the point where at the bottom, it reads astronomical twilight. So mm -hmm. do you see that mm -hmm. reading yeah. astronomical twilight? Mm -hmm. I think my video is playing now. Um, and then like, if you look at the, um, the moon elevation at that time, so we found astronomical twilight and the moon elevation is nine degrees. So if the moon is between zero and 20 degrees, typically you can get this kind of light during astro twilight, but you're also looking for a pretty big moon. Um, I find that it works best with like 80% and above. It works best right around full moon. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. So this is one of the, the kinds of light that I was um, that I became very interested in when I was doing my 100 Nights Under the Stars project because 
it's just so unique and it's not something it's it's difficult to um to find or mm, it's difficult to plan for if you don't know what you're looking for okay um, do you use any filters at all with with your astro yeah, so filters is a really great question. Um, there are some filters that are very helpful for Astro. Um, if you live in a light polluted area, you can use um, like a, a filter that will help to cut certain wavelengths of light so that you get less light pollution in your images. Mm. Um, Hoya makes filters uh, that do that. And then there's also um, a new filter that Hoya, that Hoya has come out with um, that helps to put the little um, diffraction spikes on the stars. And I haven't had a chance to try that one out yet. I have one on its way to me, but I haven't received it. But I'm really excited to try that one. Um, I think it'll be really fun. And I like the effect of it. I like to see the little spikes on the stars. That makes mm. them look super twinkly. Mm. So that's a new filter that's, that's coming out or it's already out? It's, it's already out. I've seen, um, so Stan Moniz, hi Stan. <laughs> um, he was posting about it. And as soon as I saw it, I messaged, I messaged uh, Hoya and I was like, I need one of these filters because I think they're really awesome and, um, and add a lot of, I guess, magic to a night sky image. Okay. Yeah. But filters generally, so for night photography, you don't want to cut the light unless you're, I guess, dealing with really bad light pollution, but that's a different type of light. So you're working, you're working to cut down like a, a particular um, wavelength of light, the, the sort of yellow, yellow tones um, that we often get from city lights. And, but if you were thinking like a neutral density filter or something like that, those kinds of filters cut light generally. And um, if you're already working in a low light environment, you're probably already struggling with trying to get enough light on uh, in the image to have everything properly exposed. So you don't want to use the type of filters that cut um, all types of light, like an ND or anything like that. I don't use polarizing filters or neutral density filters for nighttime images. Um, but if you're looking for something that will give your nighttime images a little pop, um, inten an intensifier filter or um, a light pollution filter would be really good. And the little ask, I don't know what the name of the filter is, but it, it uh, I think it's just called a star filter, but it puts the diffraction spikes on and it makes them look extra twinkly. So let me ask this question. Um, when you're out and you're up in the Canadian Rockies, um, I've had experiences with photo pills up at Joshua Tree and mm -hmm. no signal because, you know, it's a national park. Right. So how do you handle situations when you're out in the mountains after you've hiked 25 kilometers or 15 miles? Mm -hmm. Do you have something to help you with the signal? How do you deal with that? So with photo pills, luckily most of the most of the pills, like most of the different little tools in there, they work without any kind of signal. The only one that's not going to work for you is the planner, which is actually this one. So good timing for that question. But if you were to try to load a location, for example, so if you were to go down here to the bottom and hit load, it can't find a location for you to load but it doesn't rely on um, cellular data to do any of the other pills. So um, let's see here, I have another example. So <laughs> it's a little further away than I thought. Okay, so uh, no, that's the pills planner. This one, Spot Stars. So I use Spot Stars all the time. Spot Stars is a pill that helps you to figure out based on your particular cameras, and the focal length that you're shooting at um, and your aperture, how long you can leave the shutter open before you're going to begin to get star trailing. So um, it'll give you two different readouts and I have them highlighted here. So the default one is going to be barely noticeable star trailing. So if I was using my A7S3 at 12 millimeters to f2.8, I could in theory leave the shutter open for 27 seconds and just get like barely noticeable star trails. 
if I wanted accurate stars, like pinpoint sharp stars, then um, I would want to go with about half of that time. So 13 seconds, 13.67 seconds. So this pill and, and most of the other ones here, like if you were looking at your focal length, subject match, any of these star trails, um, night they are, none of these need data to be able to operate them. So basically, you know, and I'm glad that it also had that 500 rule on there, mm -hmm. you know, um, for someone who's still trying to do that, there's really no need or you, it's not going to work because 41 seconds is a lot of time from the 27 seconds that you showed. It's a really good point to bring up. Um, it, so the 500 rule was a lot more helpful in the DSLR days. And I think, um, you know, some people are still shooting on DSLRs, but our cameras have become like all the new cameras are, they're so light sensitive. They have these super powerful sensors, super powerful processors in them. The technology in our cameras is just unreal nowadays. Um, and that 500 rule has become pretty antiquated. Like if I left a shutter open for 40 some seconds, I'm, I'm most definitely gonna be creating some star trails. Um, the range that's most average for me to shoot uh, would be a shutter time between two and eight which is pretty crazy. Um, this image, I think I shot this one at six seconds and um, 16,000 ISO. And then I took 20 shots and I have put them through a program called Starry Landscape Stacker, which helps to average out the images and reduces the noise. And that's how I can get really, really clean shots with really sharp stars that don't have a lot of noise in them. Okay. And then it's also blue hour blended. But if I were to try and take a single shot and I use that, that 500 rule, um, I'm definitely going to have star trails for sure. Um, so the, the planner here isn't going to work if you're out on location, but it's a really handy tool. If you are at home in your, in the comfort of your pajamas and you're thinking about where you're going to go shoot, because you can literally put a pin to where you will stand and then you can see how the Milky Way is going to line up in your photo. And that is exactly how the Milky Way lines up in this photo at, at this time. So it's really accurate and really easy to use once you kind of figure it out. The, the weirdest thing for me was that if you want to plan a location, then you have to, you have to hit the load button, which doesn't seem counterintuitive. Like, I don't know, or it seems counterintuitive. But anyway, so you would hit load to find your, your location. And then after that, you can even save your plan and you can you know, refer back to it at a later time. Okay, so I'll show you a couple other apps that I use as well. And then um, Photofills will definitely come up some more because I use it for everything. But one of the ones that I really like to use for planning like weather and checking on the sky conditions is called Windy. Uh, this app actually does a ton of different things. You can measure, um, like you can track rain and snow levels. And I think it even does tides. I think you can look at smoke when we have forest fires, but for the most part, I use it for clouds. And um, it, all those little yellow hearts that you see in, in the center image, that's all my favorite locations in the Rockies. And so when I'm, uh, at, a, at a glance like that, I can see what are the cloud patterns between Kananaskis and Jasper. Kananaskis being the lower points on the right and Jasper being the upper left. And, and then I can use the time bar at the bottom and just scroll through and see when am I going to maybe get clear skies. And um, that's kind of hard to find in the Rockies, but it happens. And then when it happens, I get to make some magical images. So uh, there's two other ones that I use for looking at, you know, trying to find clear skies. One of them is not an app. It's a website called cleardarksky.com. And um, so this one, you have to have a, a particular location. You have to find something near where you're going to shoot. And, uh, and then it gives you a chart to show kind of what, what, the opacity of the clouds is going to be. So if it's a really clear sky, 
you're going to get the dark blue boxes. And um, if it's a really overcast sky, you're going to get the white boxes. And then another one that I use, and I, this is really helpful in the mountains or in, in sort of more remote areas, is called mountainforecast.com. So again, it's a website um, as opposed to an app. But this one actually allows me to look at the weather at different elevations. So I can look at the top of the mountain at 3,315 meters, or I can look at the base at 1,500 meters. And it'll tell me um, the temperature and also give me an idea of what the cloud cover is. Mostly that's helpful for temperature. Um, most weather apps are not very good at they're, they're le most weather apps are less concerned about cloud cover than, than the average night photographer is. So um, trying to figure out what the cloud cover is actually going to be is somewhat of a challenge, um, especially in the mountains, because mountains kind of make their own clouds and make their own weather. So it's a little harder to predict. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, this one's one of my favorites. Uh, this is, uh, there's actually two apps here. One is Space Weather Live and the other one is called My Aurora Forecast. And that helps me with planning for Aurora. And coincidentally, I have an Aurora right now. If I were to, if I could show you out my window, um, we probably couldn't see it because I'm looking in the wrong direction, but there is an Aurora in progress at KP5 in the mountains at the moment, um, which is pretty cool. So I like this app, um, Space Weather Live, because you can look at the real-time solar data uh, as it's happening, and um, that kind of gives you a, an indication of what the solar wind speed is as, as um, that activity travels through space. And, um, it kind of gives you a heads up of um, when you might be able to actually see activity, you know, in the next hour and, and a little bit more long range. But I really like that I can see things like um, the interplanetary magnetic field and hemispheric power, and I can kind of judge uh, when it's coming. But if you don't really know anything about Aurora, there's another app that's also super useful if you're going to go out and shoot in the night sky. And it basically just tells you what the chances are of you seeing Aurora in your particular area based on cloud cover and based on your location. So this one is really easy to use. It's called My Aurora Forecast. And um, it, yeah, it just tracks you and it, and it tells you, oh, you're, there's a, a strong probability that you'll see the Aurora tonight if you just go outside. Wow. Yeah. So. This is a little closer look at what that data looks like. Um, so I think we're all going to be geeking out tonight. An Aurora nerd. What's that? I so said, I think we're all going to be geeking out tonight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're not going to see anything too south unless, we're not. Uh, like Aurora wise, unless it was a really strong storm, like a KP7 or a KP8. You can see that in the, in the Midwest US. So, um, okay. So, that's sort of some of the things I, that's not even an extensive list, but that's some of my top favorites uh, for planning before I get out into the field. And then once I'm in the field, I also do even more planning. Um, so again, I use photo pills. Um, in the planner, if you were to go down, if you click on planner, and then you go down to the bottom uh, little ribbon here where it says night AR, um, you can pull up uh, an overlay that'll show you at a given time where the Milky Way or where the moon or um, different different sky uh, phenomena will be in your frame, basically overlaid on your subject. So this this night I was planning an Aurora or sorry I was planning a Milky Way shoot here, and I figured that you know. Um, if I was here at 3.15 in the morning, and this is in May here in the Rockies, that the, um, that the Milky Way would be basically sitting right on top of the mountain. And that's exactly what happened. So I was out there shooting at that time and I got photobombed by the Aurora. And so I got Aurora and Milky Way in the same, in the same shot. But I was able to use photo pills while I was out on location to visualize how that Milky Way was gonna line up with my peak. So that's a pretty cool tool. And you don't need um, cellular service for that because you're not trying to find new information. So like you're not trying to load a new location, you're on a location and it's just telling 
um, what the sky is going to do in relation to that. So another one of my favorite um, tools that I use, and this is when I'm out in the field, um, I'm a Sony shooter and I shoot with, uh, a, well, a pretty wide range of Sony cameras. Right now I have a, the Sony A1, um, which is a high resolution camera. And I also shoot with the Sony A7S III, which is a really light sensitive camera. So that's what I do those, those time lapses with and whatnot. And, um, and then I, I just bought a couple months ago, I bought an a7 III and I had it modified by Spencer's camera so that I could shoot. Um, so it's astro modified and that allows more of the red wavelengths of light into the camera. And um, anyways, so uh, I have multiple, multiple cameras, but they all have one feature in common. And that is this thing called bright monitoring. So what bright monitoring allows me to do is basically, it's kind of like having night vision for the camera. If I turn it on, I can see my entire composition. So if I just scrub through this video, hopefully it lets me scrub. So this is with bright monitoring off. You can kind of see things in the sky. And then when it comes on, you can actually see the foreground. Mm -hmm. So if you had, if I had a Milky Way here, you would actually be able to see the Milky Way alignment with, with my, with my mountain or whatever I'm shooting. Wow. So this is a really cool tool because I mean, if you're a Sony shooter, if you're not a Sony shooter, I'm sorry, you don't have this on your camera. So you have to be part of the Sony club for this, but um, it does. It does make it pretty amazing to go out in the middle of the night. If you're stumbling around in the dark and it's often really hard to find a composition when you're in that situation. Um, but with bright monitoring, that's like having night vision from my camera. I just turn it on and I can find a composition so fast. And then it's just a matter of getting focused. Yeah, because otherwise you have to kind of like go to this area in the daytime or, you know, earlier and try and hike and figure out your composition that way, correct? <laughs> Yeah, and I do a ton of that, but sometimes you just don't get an opportunity. Like, so this, and um, I have other examples where it's been an aurora chasing night and you go out and you, you're you hoping, oh, I'm going to maybe get aurora over Moraine Lake, but then the clouds roll in and you have to go to plan B and C and D and E. And by the end of the night, you're like driving all over the country, just trying to find a little hole in, this, in the clouds so that you can shoot um, some clear sky aurora. So, you know, sometimes we don't get to plan. Sometimes the conditions don't allow us uh, that opportunity. Maybe you're traveling and you just happen to be somewhere at night and, and you know, have an opportunity to get some cool shots and maybe you haven't had a chance to check it out first. I mean, ideally, yeah, we definitely want to check it out. And ideally, I always like to have a blue hour foreground to work with if I need to do any blending, but um, yeah, sometimes it doesn't work out like that. So if you are part of the Sony club, bright monitoring, you have to set it up on your camera. It's a custom button. You can't just go into the menu and find it. Um, and there's some information on my website. If you, if you are a Sony shooter and you do want to go and set that up, um, I, there's a little how to, but it's a pretty cool feature. Yeah, that is cool. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so yeah, that you would have to just go and set that up in your custom buttons. Okay, so we talked about this one. Um, this is another one I would use out on location, but another pill from photo pills is the spot stars function. And um, after a while, you get really good at knowing, you know, your camera and your and your particular lens. So I have a lot of these values memorized, but I do have three cameras and multiple lenses and they're all different. So I can shoot way longer shutter times on my Sony A7S III than I can on my Sony A1. The S3 is a really low resolution camera. It only has 12 megapixels. So basically they have the same, they, have, they both have full frame sensors, right? Mm -hmm. But at 50 megapixels, if you have that many megapixels, on your sensor, each megapixel is going to be smaller and lets in less light. Right. Whereas if you have a lower resolution camera, each megapixel is larger on that sensor and it can let in more light. Mm. So if you're looking for a camera for night shooting, you're better off to go with a lower resolution camera that has more light sensitivity 
generally speaking. Got it. Yeah. So yeah, uh, yeah. So photo, so spot stars. I literally use this every single time I go out, and I'm always, you know, there's lots of values that I've memorized, but um, I'm often playing with new cameras or helping helping people, you know, on workshops or whatever. And so this is like it's kind of my um, my do not deviate from guide. I use this <laughs> all the time. Okay, so. Um, Another thing that I use out in the field that I really like, and you can use this for night shooting. Um, this is a remote that enables me to do focus stacking at night. So uh, Keisha, if you're a Sony shooter, you probably be interested in this one. But basically you find your first focus point and you can do that in auto. So if, if I was shooting at night and I was using F2.8 as my, as my aperture, um, I could find my first focus point in front of me on the ground by just shining my headlamp. And, uh, and then I could, you know, find focus in autofocus, switch the camera into manual focus, and then just using the buttons on the remote, the plus minus, um, you can just step up towards infinity using the plus. So I would take my first shot at the, on the foreground in auto, and or like auto focus. And then I would switch the camera into manual and use the plus. And every time I hit the plus, it's going to change the focus of the lens just a tiny little bit. Then I can take like 20 shots. And by the time I get to infinity, I'll be focused on my stars. So it's pretty cool if you're out there shooting at night and again, fumbling around in the dark and you have to focus stack something, this is really good for focus stacking. Some cameras have them built in um, like a, a built-in focus stacker. I know that Nikon does it pretty successfully and um, some of the Canon cameras have it as well. Wow, okay. So if you ever wonder um, how people get such sharp images at such shallow depth of field, it's because of focus stacking. So I told you guys I was working on some new stuff and um, this is my very favorite piece of equipment in my bag right now. I've been playing with the slick um, ECH 630. I don't know why they don't name these things. They give them these awful numbers. But anyway, I've been playing with the uh, slick ECH Astro Tracker <laughs> and, um, and this little, the little micro adjustment knob that you see underneath of that is so that I can get more, um, more nebulosity. So uh, around constellations like Orion. So Orion is the constellation in this image. This is, <clears throat> I just shot this a couple days ago and I was in Hawaii. That's my son in the, in the photo. I had him out there um, standing on the rocks posing for me and sitting on the rocks posing for me. And I got some blue hour shots. And then I, just because the waves were coming in and crashing up on the beach, I just moved the camera back about six feet. And I just took pictures of the sky um, using the tracker. And this is the resulting image. Wow. Uh, oh, wow. It's a pretty dreamy shot. Yes. But, and I'm, yeah, I'm pretty happy with it. <laughs> I haven't heard from him yet. Hopefully he's happy with it too. <laughs> I texted it to him. Oh. So uh, just where was, the edit just minutes before our talk today. So uh, is that bioluminescence that's in that's lighting up the waves in the water? No, he has a headlamp on. So he's shining the headlamp and that's kind of why it's brighter and a little green because you're able to see the color a little bit. And mm -hmm. then keep in mind that this is the blue hour shot. So in the in the video here, you can kind of see I just took a quick this is done with my cell phone. I'm going to pause mm -hmm. it so you can see him. I don't know how, how good the video comes out, but he's standing on some rocks here so that a couple frames earlier, he was sitting down and then this wave just kind of came in and just like totally doused him and he was soaking wet and it was pretty funny. Um, it was it's like anything for you, mom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think, I think he did it for the photo. <laughs> But uh, it's pretty cool. It was pretty that witty is, little photo. That but is amazing. It's amazing to see what you can, it's amazing what the camera can pick up, especially an astro modified camera, because it's letting in more of those red wavelengths with the tracker. So the tracker made all the difference here. If I was just shooting on my regular camera, 
you would see something more like this one I showed you at the very beginning. Where did it go? Maybe it didn't save in there. Oh, here it is. This one. So you can see the stars, you can see the shape of Orion, but, and you can see a little bit of color of the stars, but it's without the tracker and without the modified camera, you, they just look like you don't get the nebulosity around it. Okay. Mm. Gotcha. Yeah. So, yeah, this is my new love right now. Yeah, I can see why. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and my favorite piece of equipment in my bag currently is this tracker. So I think, uh, Keisha, you were asking me why, <laughs> why astrophotography? And I think about that question a lot. I, I just feel compelled to, there's some part of me that has this, this need, this, um, inexplicable desire to be out under the stars. It's, it's such a happy place for me. When I was, when I was out there with my son a couple nights ago, we were looking at, you know, we're looking up at this, at the sky and obviously we don't get to see this with our eyes. We don't get to see this kind of detail or these colors or anything like that, but you know, just being there, that feeling of peace and tranquility. I don't think that there is a place I would rather be in the whole world than any place under the stars. So yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, do, um, you do landscape as well, right? Yeah, I <laughs> I do other stuff, you know, if I happen to <laughs> if I go out to shoot a night sky and, and then I get a killer sunset or a killer sunrise. I'm just kidding. I do actually, you know, I, I do all kinds of landscape photography and at at all at many times of the day. Um, but the night stuff is definitely my favorite. Yeah, so I was gonna ask you which one do you find yourself gravitating more towards? Yeah, definitely the astro. Um, it's just, there's just something magical about it. You know, that, that feeling of being able to see something on the back of the camera that you can't see with your eyes. Um, so it's something new every time, you know, that I, that I get to see the, see the universe in a way that I couldn't see just looking up at the stars. Okay. You have some beautiful work. Thank you very oh, much. Yes, absolutely. So Rachel. Um, Oh. Yeah, let's, let's now let's go ahead let's open it up for questions <laughs> so rachel um for those people like me who like have keys in hand or re ready to roll out of the house and get in the car and go to a start i mean it's texas where the stars are big and bright and all of that sure but what would you say are some of the the or like three things that a beginner should be aware of tools that they should have to have a semi um you know, successful um, time out with the night sky, um, just beginning, you know, so, you know, people don't get too discouraged or something like that. What would you suggest are the three things that you need to do in order to be mildly successful? Okay, I gotcha. Um, <laughs> but it, I might, I might go more than three things. Okay, okay so first I'm of fine. all, I'm photo fine. pills, okay? okay, because being able to plan your shot is actually a really key in being successful for any kind of night photography. Um, the more planning, the better. I know that, you know, it happens, you can, you know, just stumble into a scene and, and be like, oh, this is really cool. I, mm -hmm. and there's Milky Way and it lines up perfectly with this, but that generally doesn't happen. Um, so photo pills, as I mentioned, is good for like planning, pre-planning when you're trying to figure out a location, you're trying to figure out where you want to go. Um, but it's also really good for how long can I leave my shutter open for? Yeah, right. That's, a, that's a, that's a key question. If you don't want star trails, if you want good, sharp stars, then you have to start there. So I would say photo pills and some planning, um, and, you know, checking the weather, right. um, know before you go, I, I like to give a little safety talk when I, when I teach my online, uh, night class, um, I have had three evacuations this year alone where I had to call rescue um, oh. to help somebody in need. So the best, the best, um, what do they say? The best, best treatment is a, 
an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure or something right. like that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so knowing before you go um, what kind of situation you might be in, you know, how to best protect yourself. Is there animals you need to worry about? How do you keep right. yourself warm and safe and all that kind of stuff. So I feel like the safety thing is something we don't really mention, but we really should because I haven't met a landscape photographer yet that doesn't think they're pretty much invincible. <laughs> Most of us yeah. are like, oh, I saw so and so did that, so I should be able to do that, you know. Right. Uh, so right. Really, the safety thing um, is important. I carry a, I guess my number one, number one best friend on the safety front is this guy. It's a little um, Garmin. That Garmin. Yeah, the it's, it's called the Inreach. Inreach. Yeah. Inreach. Yeah. yeah. And I can call for help. So if I ever get myself in any trouble, you know, hopefully I'm out shooting with a buddy, but um, if I'm not, then I can use this. I can use this. You can message home um, via satellite. So you don't have to have service. Um, and it pairs with my phone by Bluetooth. So I can message my family and let them know where I am. It's really important that people know where you are in case yeah. you do need a rescue. Um, but also if I just needed, you know, if I hurt myself or something and I couldn't, I couldn't get back to my car um i just press the sos button and help will be on the way so this is super cool um so yeah if you're safe <laughs> you're more likely to be right. successful um right. then if you're a super beginner usually beginners are really struggle with focus and there is a filter it's not a hoya filter but there is a filter you can get that can help you focus it's called a sharp star and um basically it creates a diffraction spike on the stars and then mm -hmm. once you turn the focus wheel, it'll like it'll bring a line in that sort of bisects that diffraction spike or diffraction like it uh -huh. X, and yeah. then it bisects it. Anyway, it helps you focus and um, it kind of takes the guesswork out of it. A lot of people really struggle with um, finding focus. There's yeah. other things you can do too. Um, you know, depending on what kind of shooting you were going to do. So if you were only going to worry about the sky and you weren't going to worry about getting your foreground in focus, you could always find infinity during the day and then mm -hmm. tape your tape your lens. There's that trick. It's not one that I use. Mm -hmm. It's not one I really recommend because I do a lot of, um, of blending. And so that's not ideal for blending if you want focus somewhere else. But right. um, it's a way that you could manage it. So focus is a, is a big one for yeah. most beginners. Yeah. So that sharp star filter would would help with something like that. That's good. No. Yeah. Sharp star. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, so planning, safety, focus, and what else would I recommend? Going with somebody, like if you have if you have the opportunity to go and shoot with somebody, I think there's um it's usually more fun. Um, I say usually you don't want to go with your high maintenance friend, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe somebody who's not going to complain about being cold or tired. Right. Um, but yeah, usually it's fun to go with somebody and, uh, just, you know, another set of eyes and it just, you know, um, I don't know, somebody to bounce ideas off of, uh, I, I recommend being able to go out with a buddy and that way, you know, it's a little safer and you have a little more confidence out there in the dark and um, you're probably going to have more fun. That's great. That's really good. I mean, you know, it's all about when if, if I wanted to ever do a photo tour and you want to take people out and have people have varying, uh, you know, skill levels. It's just good to yeah. know what kind of can help out with those yeah. people who are just going out for the first time. So that's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, and a, a headlamp, uh, obviously you're going to be able to see what you're doing. I don't know if I mentioned that, but a lot of people, um, there's this like, I, I joke with my clients and uh, participants that if they use a red light, I'm going to feed them to the coyotes. <laughs> so red lights on your headlamp are going to help your eyes to adjust. Um, so if you're stumbling around in the dark and you turn on your red light for a minute, um, it's a lot easier for your eyes to adjust from dark to light to have that lamp on or off. However, if you splash red light over your friend's composition, you can't get rid of it. Or, I mean, you right. can't without some serious efforts. So um, it's not recommended if you're out shooting with somebody else to use yeah. a red light on right. your headlamp. So a little, a little etiquette there. Yeah. Um, getting mm -hmm. to know your camera and knowing where the buttons are for 
how to change your ISO shutter and aperture without looking, without having to shine a light on your camera is not only super time saving for you, but also less annoying for the people who, around you who are shooting with you because so you don't have to turn your light on. I'd also say you want to know where your either your two second timer is or how to use your remote. Um, and um, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> just being able to find you find your way around your camera in the dark. So whenever I have like super new people to night photography, I recommend that they just, you know, sit in, in the comfort of home in the dark doing, you know, finding the buttons and changing aperture, changing ISO, changing shutter speed and looking at the playback. Oh, that was the other one. Um, so that you can look at the playback and then know, oh, this is in focus or it's not in focus. But right. the more you can do without having to turn a light on to look at your camera, then the faster it'll go. Yeah. Hey, those are all some great tips. And um we're kind of running out of time a little bit here again. All right, no worries. <laughs> you to be a long talker. I'm sorry about that. Oh. It was a pleasure having you, and we learned we learned a lot. At least I learned a lot. Um, about yeah, Astro more and, Sony stuff. Yeah, Astro <laughs> and um, we're gonna pull you uh, to the dark uh, side. The, <laughs> the photo so sure. um, where can where can you know people find you? Your social media, your website. Um, yeah, uh, so I can give you my website. Let's see if I can click to the next page. So my website is astralisphotography.com. It's a geeky Latin word meaning of a star or born from the stars, which is I think how my photography got started. So that's how that name came to be. Okay. Um, and you can find me on pretty much any social media platform with just my name, Rachel Jones Ross. I don't think I have, I don't think I have a slide with my name on it. So, oops. Um, but yeah, you can definitely find me uh, through my website and, and online just with my name, Rachel Jones Ross. And we'll put all your contact information in the comments section too of the video um, for everybody. So. Okay. And we would like to thank you, James. Akira and Beatrice for um, hanging out with us tonight and talking with Rachel. And to all those who are gonna view this video, please like, subscribe, share our video. Thank you. Thank you so much for having Thank me, you. guys. Thank you. Have a great I'll night. see you again, Rachel. <laughs> I'm sure we will. Come to a Sony event. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>